Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and welcome to another episode of Northwood Scientist. Now this is an episode I've been looking forward to doing for quite some time. I did one on laser ring gyros a couple of months ago and it was very popular and I wanted to complete the journey. So today we're going to talk about three different instruments. The first is a mechanical gyroscope. Now, a mechanical gyroscope has several problems with it, including one of precession. So we're going to talk about how we solve that problem with laser gyroscopes. And then we're going to finish up with how we took advantage of those problems with a mechanical gyro compass. So, without further ado, let's get started. Now here's the interesting thing about a gyroscope. Even though the base of the gyroscope is generally very small and it's very top heavy, once you spin it up, it will remain upright. Okay, now the way that a gyroscope remains upright is due to something called conservation of angular momentum. Now, when you take a gyroscope and you spin it about an axis, you set up something called angular momentum. Now that angular momentum is in line with this central axis of rotation. Okay, the best way to look at what angular momentum is, is to look at it as a resistance for something to be pushed over. Now, the bigger the angular momentum, the less a given force will push it over. Now here's an example. We have two vectors of angular momentum here. We have the blue one, and then we have a red one. And as you see, the red one is bigger than the blue one is. Both start off at the y-axis and are pushed over by one unit of force. Look at the angle formed between the x-axis and that blue vector. It's almost 45 degrees. Even though the red vector was pushed over the same amount by the same force, Look at the angle it forms. It's much less. It resisted being pushed over. In order to push, it, push the red one over as much as that blue vector is, you actually have to apply maybe double the force to bring it all the way over to 45 degrees. So that is what angular momentum does. Now gyroscopes work by conservation of angular momentum. Once a gyroscope spins up, it wants to keep the angular momentum in the same spot. It doesn't want to tilt. In order to make the gyroscope tilt, you actually have to apply a force to it, and that force is called torque. Okay, so let's review real quick. The angular momentum is directed along the axis of rotation of the gyroscope. The faster this gyroscope rotates, the bigger the angular momentum is. Now how do we tell what is the direction of this angular momentum? Because it not only has a magnitude, it has a direction. That's actually pretty easy. Now I'm going to caution you, this video is reversed. This hand, the one that has my class ring on it, is my right hand. My watch and my wedding band are on my left hand. So we take our right hand and we wrap it around the gyroscope in the direction of the rotation and stick our thumb up. The thumb is the direction of the angular momentum. Now the next question that we have to talk about is one of torque. Now, if we have a gyroscope that is spinning in this direction and the angular momentum is here, in that direction, what happens if I put force right here and try and bend the gyroscope toward the camera. Now, most people would think that the gyroscope would actually just dip toward the camera, but it does not. It actually dips to the side. Let's see if we can figure out how that happens. Now again, we need to emphasize something on this angular momentum. The angular momentum is along this axis of rotation of the gyroscope. It is in the direction determined by the right-hand rule. The faster this gyroscope spins, the more angular momentum there is. 
Now, angular momentum is a resistance to having the gyroscope tilted. If we do place a force on this gyroscope to try and tilt it over, that's called developing a torque. Now let's look at that a little closer. Let's say this pen is the angular momentum of a gyroscope that is rotating about it in this direction. It goes from the base of the pen up to the cap. Now, if I press down on the front of the gyroscope and try and bend it this way, what am I really doing? I'm actually applying a torque to this pen and trying to make it move in a circle like this. So, what would the direction of force be? We apply the torque to bend it that way. We wrap our fingers of our right hand around in the direction of that torque and stick our thumb out. The force is going off to the side. So, pressing down on the gyroscope in the front actually puts a force on the pen to move it that way. Unless an outside force acts on it to move it, it's going to remain in this plane and in this direction. That's how a gyroscope stays up, even though it has a very small base and it's very top heavy. That's how you can balance it on a piece of string. It wants to continue to go in this direction around this axis of rotation. So why does the spinning gyroscope wobble and seem to go around in a circle? That's a process called precession. Now let's see if we can put this all together and figure out why a gyroscope wobbles like that. Now, here's our gyroscope. It's spinning in this direction. By the right-hand rule, the direction of angular momentum is along the central axis going up. Now, what happens if this gyroscope goes a little bit off balance and is no longer straight up and down? Well, it's tilted now. So gravity will pull on this and try and tilt it down this way. Recall what happens. Let's tilt it towards the camera. Recall what happens when I try and tilt the gyroscope in that direction. What is the direction of the force? It's off to the side. So as the gyroscope tilts, it will turn in a left circle, like so. And that is why a gyroscope wobbles. This is called gyroscopic precession. Now, if you get right down to it, because the gyroscope will start wobbling like this, that's actually proof that there is a downward force acting on this gyroscope. Okay, so while most of us understand that a gyroscope, once it spins up, will try and stay in the same position unless an outside force acts on it, we've now seen that there is an outside force acting on it, and that's the force of gravity. There is a force that causes the gyroscope to go off balance, and then gravity starts acting on it and causing it to process. This limits its use in navigation and other functions where we need to have a steady frame of reference. So what we did to overcome this is we took out the mass. We took out the mechanical parts of the gyroscope and went to something that was not affected by gravity, and that is the laser gyroscope. Now, in order to understand the laser ring gyroscope and its cousin, the fiber optic gyroscope, we need to understand a little bit about the nature of light. Light can be considered to travel in waves. Now, as you can see by this diagram, if you have wave X and wave Y, these are two beams of light that are of the same frequency, which means that the wavelengths are basically mirror images of each other. In the situation on the left, you have what's called constructive interference. You notice that the peak of wave X and the peak of wave Y occur at the same time, as do the troughs of wave X and wave Y. As a result, 
the resulting waveform, which is waveform z or zeta, is twice the amplitude of the first two. Now in the second situation on the right, you see destructive interference. Notice that the peak of wave x falls on the trough of wave y. And as a result, when they add together, they form a flat line. This is the basis of the fiber optic and the laser ring gyro. Now here is a diagram of the very basic components of a laser ring gyro. The cylinder there is a laser generator, and it shoots out a laser beam of a certain frequency in phase 180 degrees in opposite directions. These laser beams hit mirrors and are angled up to a readout sensor, which determines whether they are in phase or out of phase and at what rate of change that phase is undergoing. You can see that if you rotate this laser ring gyro in the plane of the table that it's sitting on, you can see that one beam may have a slightly longer path to that detector than the other beam. That is how it compares the beams and determines whether that laser ring gyro is being rotated in that plane. The resulting interference shows these alternating dark and bright bands. Now, these bands move back and forth to the left and right, depending on which way the laser gyro is being rotated. How fast they rotate has to do with how fast the gyro is rotating. Now, on commercial airliners, we have something called the inertial reference system, and this is part of the navigation package of the aircraft. In this type of installation, three laser ring gyros are installed and attached directly to the airframe. Now, each of these gyros is in its own axis, the X, the Y, and the Z axis. And as a result, pilots get very detailed information on pitch, roll, and yaw based on these laser ring gyros being rotated in their various axis of rotation. Well, folks, that about wraps it up for this episode. Now, we've gone over mechanical gyroscopes and we've gone over laser gyroscopes. On Monday, we're going to go over mechanical gyro compasses. Now, on Earth, a gyroscope cannot remain upright. It will begin to tilt. Once it tilts, gravity begins to apply a torque to the axis of rotation. That causes the gyroscope to begin to process in a circle. To solve this problem, we developed laser gyroscopes, which operate on the Sagnac effect and a pattern of constructive and de destructive interference. This tells us if that laser gyro is being rotated in one axis. The inertial navigation system of aircraft have three such gyros, one in the X, the Y, and the Z axis, to give information to the pilot on pitch, roll, and yaw. Now, the laser gyro, both the laser ring and the fiber optic gyroscope, were developed to overcome the problem of mechanical gyroscopic precession. Now, on Monday, we'll talk about gyro compasses, which take advantage of gyroscopic precession to seek true north. Now, your homework assignment over the weekend is to see if you can figure out why mechanical gyroscopic precession leads the gyroscope to point to true north. And a hint is right there. So until then, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from northern Michigan. We'll see you again soon. Please take a moment, hit that little like and subscribe down there. Maybe have a look at my Twitter account. That's where I release all of my videos first. So we'll be seeing you again soon. Thank you for stopping by.